Greetings, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jay Tucker, and I run the Center for Management of Enterprise and Media, Entertainment, and Sports here at UCLA Anderson, otherwise known as the Center for Memes. And we are so pleased to be partnering with the Foundation for Global Sports Development on this very, very special topic, very special session. Um, as you can imagine, obviously, we've seen so much transformation over the last few years with the business of sports and entertainment. And thanks to COVID, we've all been, I think, a lot more aware of what's happening with sports. But I think it's important that we talk about safety and protecting our athletes, particularly our student athletes. And I think this documentary um, and the conversation that we're gonna have today go a long way to start to raise awareness and hopefully get us moving in the right direction. Um, I'm not gonna say any more than that because we have some incredible people to share their wisdom and experience with you, but I will uh, hand it over actually. It's my pleasure to present the short message from Dr. Steven Ungerleiter, who's um, the producer of the At the Heart of Gold documentary and the co-founder of the Foundation for Global Sports Development. So we'll take a look at this intro and then um, we'll start the session right away. Hello, I'm Dr. Steven Ungerleiter, co-founder and executive board member for the Foundation for Global Sports Development and Sidewinder Films. As a producer and writer of At the Heart of Gold, Inside the USA Gymnastics Scandal, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this film and join the discussion, since I consider this documentary to be one of the most important projects I've ever worked on. I was a collegiate gymnast and my love of sports followed me into adulthood and eventually fatherhood. Both of my daughters were also gymnasts. I have dedicated my life as a psychologist to championing programs that offer access to safe, abuse-free sport for youth, which is why learning the details of what happened to these young women was particularly devastating. Prior to embarking on this journey, I'd heard rumors about sexual abuse in elite sport. I was shocked to learn the true extent of the problem as we conducted the research for this film. We knew this story could only be told through the voices of those who lived it, the survivors. These women who came forward with their victim impact statements exemplify courage and are an inspiration to all who hear them speak. Their collective voice has awakened us all to what needs to be done to protect future generations. The work has begun, but there is still a lot more to do, as demonstrated by the ever-increasing number of revelations that have come to light since this landmark case. The film and every conversation it sparks is a tribute to survivors around the world. I want to thank our distinguished moderator and panelists for lending their support to this program. We hope by raising awareness and offering resources, you will feel empowered to join us in our mission to help end abuse. We encourage you to learn more by visiting www.globalsportsdevelopment.org. Thank you so much, Stephen. I love that guy. Uh, welcome students, student athletes, faculty, staff, friends of UCLA, global sports development, child health and beyond. Thank you so much for joining us to discuss identifying and preventing sexual violence in sports. Our hope is that you will learn more about this topic from our panelists, including actionable ideas that you'll be able to use yourself or to help someone that you know. I'm Daphne Young, Chief Communications Officer of Child Health, and we're proud to have partnered with Global Sports Development in reaching over 160,000 youth athletes, coaches, and families with prevention education. We continue this partnership with Courage First. We are so grateful to the UCLA Center for Media, Entertainment, and Sports for partnering with Global Sports Development to create a forum for this conversation. This event is offered through Global Sports Development's Courage First program, thanks in part to strategic partners, including UC Speaks Up, to help prevent abuse and offer resources to those who might need it most. We're hosting this discussion on April 1st. This is an important day. 
It's the first day of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, which also happens to be Youth Sports Safety Month. Remember that today's discussion may be triggering. So I'm gonna encourage you to practice some self-care during and after this talk. We'll be providing support resources links in the Zoom chat for your convenience. For those that are part of the UCLA family community, please visit careprogram.ucla.edu slash get slash help slash resources. You don't have to remember that, it's gonna be in your chat. For attendees within the United States, you may call or text Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline. We've got uh, confidential 24 seven exclusive degree crisis counselors that are ready to work with anyone from young athletes that need to report to families seeking resources or survivors that just need to talk. So whether you wanna make the call 1-800-422-4453 or you're quarantining and you wanna have a private conversation and you just wanna text or chat without anyone else listening, again, 1-800-422-4453. If you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to answer. And after this event, you're gonna be sent a short survey that is crucial to us gauging the impact of this program and helping inform the prevention of sexual violence. Please help us keep these conversations going by getting your input in there because your voice really matters in this topic. So it is my honor to introduce two panelists, and it's great to see you again, Trinae Gonzer, uh, a gymnast from Lansing, Michigan, survivor of Larry Nassar, and an advocate of sexual violence prevention and supporting survivors. She's currently the Director of Development for Avalon Healing Center in the city of Detroit, where she lives with her husband and sons. It's wonderful to see you again, a true hero. Uh, also, Jonathan Vaughn uh, is an award-winning former University of Michigan football player and abuse survivor who went on to play in the NFL and NFL Europe. He's now an entrepreneur, he's a father, he's an activist. He's committed to ending sexual abuse by educating others and supporting statute of limitations reform in Michigan and other legislation to safeguard youth. Uh, this is an issue near and dear to my heart. I've worked on some of that legislation in Arizona. It is tough work and it is essential. Uh, thank you both for bringing your voices to the table. I wanna thank you for participating uh, at, to spread the awareness about sexual abuse, resources for survivors, and also uh, what we can do to help prevent this. Uh, going public about personal trauma is really difficult and your doing so is a testament to your strength, your commitment to protecting others. And so on behalf of everyone that's listening here today, I wanna, I wanna thank you both. And um, as I learn more about your cases, I was struck at how many parallels exist between you two. Uh, both happened in Michigan. They both involve doctors. I, I say doctors slash predators um, attached to sports programs who disguised their abuse as routine examinations or treatments. And both doctors were able to continue abusing athletes for decades even though there had been many complaints. John, uh, it is so important for us to have men's voices in this fight. And we've been doing it too long without strong men stepping forward. And I want to start with you since it has been over a year uh, since you realized you were abused by the team doctor while attending the University of Michigan and playing for their renowned football program. So uh, just starting out, how did you find out what you had been through? Was not routine medical practice? And what's it been like just, just processing that information? Oh, wow. Um, I actually found out from one of my best friends and teammates um, two weeks after my 50th birthday, March 26th of last year that an article had come out in February in the Detroit News um, because a former Michigan wrestler had sent a letter actually on the day of the ESPYs when all of the gymnasts were receiving their courage award. And um, after reading his uh, letter and seeing how the university had covered it up for those two years, I was shocked, um, disbelief, um, he 
because what it did, it took me back 30 years to thinking about my daily life at the University of Michigan and understanding that the testicular cancer exams and the prostate exams that we were being subjected to were unwarranted and were by the thousands. Um, so if you can imagine a ton of, a ton of emotions, disbelief, anger, uh, betrayal, loneliness, um, and also, you know, not knowing which direction to go in. And luckily I was able to be introduced to my attorney, Mike Cox, who um, actually filed the first case against Michigan to really get an understanding of, you know, what actually is going on here. Um, because naively, um, and I've told, especially Amos this, I thought the Michigan State and the Penn State issues were isolated instances. But as this year has gone on, it's case after case, story after story that started my focus, not just on Michigan, but in youth sports as a whole and saying that this is an epidemic yeah. um, and it's very tragic. But the voices that you were singing out in front were these Goliath organizations right. and too often were the victims slash survivors faceless, nameless, voiceless. And yep. so that's when I decided to get into the fight. And it's, it's so huge to have men's voice in this uh, because we need allies, survivors. People need to look at someone that looks like me that's been through what I've been through and say, if, if he can do it, I can do it. If he's strong enough, I'm strong enough. And what you're describing as a dual betrayal, first of all, you have a doctor in a position of power and trust. Uh, we believe in their knowledge. So when they're telling us this is essential, we believe them. We're not doctors, so we're in their hands. And then secondarily, uh, which is the scary part, is a big collective system of apathy and colluders and folks that are all working to, to save a lot of money and, and get rid of a lot of problems. And so covering up systemic abuse year after year after year, and Trinae's nodding her head because she's like a pro at this at this point. You started this journey a few years before Jonathan. And um, can you tell us um, what that looked like and what survivors can expect as they work through this trauma over time? Because when it's fresh, you got your activacy in you and you're like ready to roll, but what happens at, over time? Well, like, um, like John mentioned, you know, there's the initial uh, shame, um, shock. Um, like you had mentioned, Daphne, you know, you have doctors that um, you trust because if somebody, if a doctor were to give you a diagnosis of strep throat and give you a, an antibiotic, you're not questioning that. You're not asking for a second opinion because you trust the medical professional that's administering that information to you. Um, so you don't doubt and you don't question, but as these things come upon you and you realize you've had these procedures or these um, essentially assaults happening to you hundreds and hundreds of times, uh, there's a lot of confusion and uh, going backwards and trying to re remember certain things and how that happened. Um, and, and there's a lot of shame that comes with that and a lot of shame uh, victim blaming too. Uh, why didn't they come forward until now? You know, they're this age, why didn't they say anything then? Well, it's, it's extremely difficult because as we learned and as we have learned in the work that I'm doing, um, Predators are not typically the white van of the guy that's driving down the street that you don't know. They're much more common, the person that you do know and the person that's in your life and that's that's gaining your trust intentionally to be able to manipulate your your experience with them so that they can assault you or, or your children or your family members or someone in your life. So it's really not how we all envisioned it in our mind of what it really looks like. And, and I think that that as a culture, as a society, we have a lot of work to do because assaults been happening, sexual assault specifically since the beginning of time. I mean, it's been happening always. And this is a human issue. This isn't just a women's or men's. And I applaud again, John, thank you for being here because men 
you know, men have a, a report, they report less typically, and um, they come forward less. And, but that doesn't mean that those aren't happening. And so when other men see other men step to that plate, they do feel the courage and they do feel the ability to follow that lead because it is happening. Um, but in the same sense, men, um, we want men to be our allies in this. So, um, you know, men to be able to call out other men or recognize certain behavior that used to be acceptable and okay, that it's not okay and that that needs to change and that they recognize that somebody in their circle is having inappropriate behavior and probably has for several years or always. Um, but one thing I've realized that I, I didn't expect as I was going through this personally um, was those unexpected triggers. Um, so, you know, right now we have the Eastern Michigan uh, University case that's happening with those survivors coming forward. And I, and it's, and again, the U of M case with the, the men, it's, it's like reliving your trauma without realizing that you're going to relive it by reading something that's happening almost exact to how it happened in your experience and realizing that these major institutions have so much power and typically money to cover up these kind of behaviors or push them under the rug so that they don't look like the bad guys in this or enablers in this. Um, and so it's kind of having those preparations that you can sometimes be feeling like you're really going forward. And then sometimes you're gonna go five steps backwards and then two steps forward and then five steps backwards. So really realizing that healing has no timeline um, that the journey is always, and you're always going to be in a space where there's a possibility for something, as John mentioned, these cases coming forward in mass because they have been happening. It's just a matter of, of people coming forward to expose this kind of behavior. And I actually think that your trigger, well, while we sometimes feel vulnerable in a trigger, I actually think that's part of healing because your heart is still open to the issue. You're still empathetic. You're still feeling a lot, which means you can be that strong advocate for someone else because you're not shut down because you haven't repressed because you're not blocking everything. So yeah, when it comes to you, it's tough, but it's also means I'm still open to doing this good work because my heart is open and that's a big piece. Um, you know, John, we were talking about identity. My dad uh, is a former college football player and, uh, and he tells me stories. And to this day, a lot of his identity is still in some of that being alignment. You know, he'll say, well, this is alignment's way, you know, and he'll kind of still talk about that stuff. And I know that um, being a Michigan man was an important part of how you saw yourself. And um, there's a sense of betrayal then in that self-identity. There's a sense of betrayal in what happened uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, how you felt before and, and how you connected with that identity and how you feel now? Um, you know, coming from the background that I came from, from Florida, Missouri, a small city in St. Louis, and actually ob obtaining the opportunity to play scholarship football at Michigan, that was my transition from boy to man. And so a lot of the principles that I learned um, in the process of becoming a Michigan man, we're doing those three years. And so when you, as a 50 year old, um, and, I, and I, I anchor on a quote that Muhammad Ali once said, that a man in his fifties that looks at life the same way in his twenties has wasted 30 years. Yes. So, the maturity and the experience and the gray hair that I have now looking back on how these men came into my home, talked to my parents, uh, got my mother to allow me to actually leave home and go to Michigan, the betrayal was devastating. Yeah. Uh, and then when we focus on this past year, then you see, you know, Les Miles recruited me. Uh, I love Les Miles, but to see what has transpired at LSU and him being let go at Kansas, you're seeing these tentacles that grow over decades. And so you look at the entire system, not just Michigan, the Big Ten, the NCAA, it's the system that is flawed and it's the system which if you understand anything about war when we talk about these armies of enablers 
a well-funded army is a very successful army. And so I also started to think about what about the Nikes and the ESPNs and all the corporate partners that fund these institutions off of wins and losses and then forget the Trinays and the Johns and you know whoever else, we become a number or a participant in the overall building up of the Goliath. And then we're made to feel like the Davids that have no chance. And so it's tough because you're being asked, um, I'm sure within the gymnastics world, as well as Michigan, that your love for Michigan or your love for USA Gymnastics is greater than your love for yourself. And so that goes into a, another, you know, the gaslighting and the, you know, the grooming that is done to parents and, and, and all parts of the organization that the coaches, the system, the universities, the governing bodies are, you know, mistake-free and they can do no wrong, but yet you're asked to, it's almost a situation where do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, yeah. And you and, made a great analogy. Right. You made a perfect analogy when you called it like an army because it's well orchestrated, it's well funded, it's all planned out. But then when I think about your role in it, people love to talk about what the players make and focus on the players. But in many ways, you're describing yourself as, as troops and then casualties of, of war if you come forward, right? So your troops, when you're playing and you're falling in line and, and you go out there and you put your bodies and your spirits and your hearts on, on the front lines and then something happens, you get injured, you get harmed, uh, you somehow become a problem to the institution or the army, suddenly you're a casualty of war, suddenly you're out. Um, and and that's, a, that's a brutal truth that I think a lot of people don't think about. Um, and you mentioned grooming. And John, if you could give me a little sense of, of the grooming that you experienced. Um, I was telling Amos uh, a couple of days ago, I remember the first time that I was groomed or gaslit when I was asked, are you injured or are you hurt? And that was the first time I had been questioning myself as an athlete because I was in excruciating pain, uh, happened to be a dislocated finger um, pointing this way when it should be pointing this way. Um, not am I okay? Not do we need to see the trainer? It was a coach that said, are you hurt? Are you injured? So those seeds of when it all costs, um, a Michigan man doesn't complain. Um, if, the, if, if your teammate is doing this, you should be too. Don't drink any water. Don't take off your helmet. Um, your team is now your family. So there's this isolation and there's this almost uh, forced silence that is placed upon you because you're looking at it done not only to you, but to your teammates. So, and if you're not on the field or if you're not contributing in practice, you're not relevant to the university or to success of the coaches or the organization. And so I also think that out your circle, your, your family members, uh, your parents, grandparents, whoever are also groomed into what a great opportunity to carry on the legacy of your family, to carry on the legacy of your neighborhood, your school. And so there's this pressure that's put on you to succeed up and beyond the normal pressure that we as elite athletes put on ourselves to perform. Right. And so you're carrying this weight, but you're carrying this weight in silence. Absolutely. And Trené, you know, you, you had um, a very similar experience where it, it was a family affair, just as John describes. It's like there's a whole group of people saying amazing things about your potential future and then all the way down to a doctor being responsible for your health. I mean, what parent wouldn't want that kind of focused attention on their child's body, their future, everything? It feels like the ultimate opportunity. Can you share a little bit about your grooming experience? 
Yeah, um, I started I started seeing Larry at eight years old um, and I had a dislocated hip and in gymnastics, you know, we do a lot of splits, specifically center splits. So a dislocated hip becomes very problematic for a gymnast. And so um, with his medical technique, um, hip and lower back were his essential target for this procedure. And um, with us, we were told because we were spe specifically picked for Great Lakes Gymnastics at that time, which is now was now Twistars. You know, you had to try out for that team. You weren't just part of the team. You had to try out, and you had hundreds of girls trying out, and he, and they would maybe select fifteen or sixteen uh, girls to to carry on the, into the team. But we were told that lucky for us, we had this on staff trainer that we saw and that would help facilitate from a medical space, either which doctor we need to see in an aftermath, whether it's a surgeon or you know, uh, physical therapy or things like that. But we were really lucky to have who we had because um, you know, he was gonna be carrying on to medical school where he was going to look into sports medicine. And we, you know, we were really lucky to have that. And um, I mean, he worked with us as, as from everything to injury prevention, to healthy eating and nutritional guidelines we had to follow. You know, so there was a lot of things that he did with us. So it was, it was, it was a lot of things at home. And in my case, and in the girls that were from my time, you know, we spent days and, and days together, 25 hours, sometimes 30 hours, sometimes at the gym. So you really become more family with your teammates and your coaches and your trainers than you do your own family. So those are people that I trusted, my family trusted that were to get us to the Olympics. I mean, we were becoming an Olympic training center. We were first in the country. We were noticed for our sport. We had girls traveling in from hours away to train at our gym. And so it was a perfect breeding ground for him, as well as having the John Gettert space to kind of be the good cop, bad cop. Uh, you know, that grooming was every single day, every, he almost his strategic, if you were to look up grooming and predatory behavior, he was your exact textbook of how it works and how it, how it does, because he was so intentional with every step that he made to make all of us feel like he was, had our best interest at heart. So if he's fixing my wrist and he fixes my wrist, I don't assume that he's not going to fix my hip because he's fixing my hip. So, you know, there was a lot of times where we were eating dinner together, we were having slumber parties at the gym, you know, and he was always there. I had surgery on my ovaries unrelated to gymnastics, and I woke up from surgery to Larry in my, you know, post-op. And he was there with the intention to make sure I was taken care of and everything. And, and there was no better feeling that I had when I woke up to him because I knew him, you know? So there was just so many levels that go so deep and really that's so common. Again, when I speak to that predatory behavior and those people that we envision versus the reality of who they are, those people work days and days and years to be in that space with us, so. Right, and it starts starting so young and moving yeah. through the life. And, you know, when we talk to kids uh, in, in youth athletics, um, one of the things we talk about is grooming hey, they're grooming you for the NBA, they're grooming you for the Olympics, they're grooming you for the NFL, they could also be grooming you in a uh, less joyous sense, in a very dark sense um, for abuse. And this is what that looks like. So grooming you for the good stuff means doing everything out in the open and making sure to not keep secrets. Grooming you for the other stuff is a whole different story. But so much of what you guys experienced was out in the open. It was communal. So your team member was going through the same thing you were. So it didn't seem off. Uh, and, and that's part of the problem. And then uh, in, as we saw in the film, the um, older girls then being used to tell the younger girls, it's okay, this is part of what we do and it helps me get better. And then they watch their mentor heroes and it keeps that cycle going unknowingly to the poor folks that have been drawn into this. And then you layer another piece on top, which is the sports ideal of being tough, not showing weakness, um, not being vulnerable. 
And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, you know, especially um, with what I was told um, my, my dad in the sports culture amongst men in the locker room and stuff, that toughness is you, you like you described, you don't need water, I don't need water either. Uh, you play with your fingers like this, me too, <laughs> I'm good to go. And that kind of like get up and keep moving. And so uh, when it comes to something like this, then, um, you know, how do you break through and show some vulnerability? Well, I think from a survivor standpoint, you can't have trust without vulnerability. And so, um, plus you get 50 <laughs> and you really start to be comfortable in your own skin again. And my truth is my truth, but I know that some can't speak the truth. So I've heard from tens of guys that I respected who were some of the greatest that ever played at Michigan, but all they can say is me too. So just like in the middle of a competition, your team rallies around you, then you carry the ball. And so for me, it's taking all of the experiences and channeling them for good. But I also think um, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And sometimes the right thing or the righteous thing to do is not going to gain you any friends, but we're talking about lives. I mean, when I hear the story of the gymnast at such a young age, it breaks my heart. But then I look at I come into Michigan as a teenager, not knowing whose mother had breast cancer. So when cancer was discussed and prostate, you know, I didn't even know what a prostate was at 18. But your assumption, because you want to be that gold medal gymnast or that starting running back for Michigan is everyone that came before you is dealing with the same thing and everything that everyone will come after you would deal with the same thing. So you thought that whatever you did, it becomes 24 hours of your life. So you just went along with the program because these were, like you said, your heroes before you, the coaches, authority figures. And there's a purity in sport that I think most don't understand at an elite level is that forget the gold medals, forget the accolades and all that stuff because that's not what happens at practice. It's how can I be the best that I can be, not only for myself, but then for the greater good of the team. And so you start to sacrifice your own, and that's where that tunnel vision comes in where things that feel off are a part of the level of competition or the level of notoriety or the stage that you're on. And so it's about how do I block out everything that's uncomfortable so that I can completely hone into the God-given abilities that I've been given to perform at a level that quite frankly is atypical of just your athletes in general. I mean, it takes a special type of focus and a special type of pain management. And I think that we don't understand pain either. There's mental and there's physical, but the mental is always greater than the physical. The physical you can heal from. The mental, you have to block out all of your feelings as well as the physical to achieve greatness. And in all of these cases, that is the driving point. It's the drive of the athletes that because of the culture that put us in these positions where these institution and these predators take advantage of. I mean, it's almost like Michigan rolled out a buffet for a wildebeest for lions that are crossing in the Serengeti's because there are thousands of athletes that had 
to have treatment from this doctor. There are thousands of gymnasts that were seen by Mary Nasser. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost incomprehensible. What breaks my you, heart is, is yeah. you're talking about giving it all your heart, like everything, your heart and soul, and then they break your heart. It's like you, you, you give everything, you give up, you give up pain, you give up all, you know, almost give up every vulnerability to this great art. Cause it's really an arts. I think when you're, when you get hit a certain level of sport, you're beyond athlete, right? You're almost an artist of the sport because it's so personal. Uh, and what you can bring to the table is body, mind, spirit. And then when they break those individual pieces by breaking trust and by betraying, um, you know, so many people can be broken uh, for, for so long. And what, what's interesting is you, you use the, uh, you talked about a few uh, people just coming forward to saying me too to you, but you say like, I'm willing to carry the ball. So you're still in that team mentality. Like, you know, maybe they need to sit on the sidelines and heal right now and they need someone else to carry the ball. And I know, uh, at Trine, that's been very much part of your experience where you've been one of those out front voices. And there are some, uh, some of the sister survivors that need to like sit for a minute and breathe through this and are not in, as vulnerable right now because they're so vulnerable inside. And how did you kind of work through that vulnerability similar to what Jonathan's doing to be able to be that activist? Well, gymnastics is an interesting sport if you think about it. Well, and the elite level of athletics as a whole, I mean, any of those athletes are literally built as machines in a sense. They're trained to perform. So they are built physically, mentally from their soul to perform and to perform well. So, but gymnastics, you are on the floor by yourself. You don't have anybody to throw a ball to. You don't have anybody to help you knock somebody or any, you have one person and mentally you either perform or you don't. And uh, in gymnastics, my coach specifically, we were not allowed to cry. Now, I don't know why crying seems to bother people so much because it is really true. Like in, in most people's mind, crying is a, um, it's essentially a form of weakness, but in reality, it is your body releasing an emotion, whether it's anger or sadness or fear or happiness, you know, crying doesn't have to be the worst thing that's ever happened because you cried. And we were taught if you cry at a competition, regardless of what you are, where you are in that competition, you leave. Your parents are taught to take you out of the competition and you do not get to continue competing. So if you cry for any other reason than a broken bone or you need to be taken by ambulance to the hospital, you are ejected and this was just our gym. So this isn't necessarily the sport as a whole, but from our team, you are not allowed to compete if you cried one tear. So you didn't perform and you cried, you might as well have broken your neck because performing and crying, like there, there was an, so we were trained to be little machines at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, and then up, up through that. Um, so with that being said, you know, we were taught to be so tough and never ask questions. If somebody's telling you to do, you do. If somebody's telling you not to do, you don't do. And if somebody's telling you to perform and you better win, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I stood at the end of the vault. So if you know the vault, so one, one runway, you hit a springboard, you flip and you land. So it's a one straight shot that my coach would be standing at the end of that runway, arms crossed, legs spread with the eyes of, if you mess this up, you are dead meat. You are going to be doing a hundred pull-ups. You are going to be doing a hundred, you know, it's like the worst thing that you have to do is hundred sit-ups and a hundred pull-ups and you have to be trained more as a machine. So in reality, this culture that as, as athletes, we are trained, especially elite athletes to be the best at any cost, whatever that is. If that means climbing a rope a hundred times or a hundred push-ups or turning away from a procedure that's making you question or doubt or feel uncomfortable. You do not question anyone. You become any, the best time. victim. You must become the best victim you of a perpetrator victim. to keep being the best at everything else, right? To not have- And if you ask questions, 
or if you wonder, you are blacklisted. You are literally out of that. Like Dominique Luciano, for example, she really came out after the Olympics when she won, uh, that the Crowleys were abusive. She was literally blacklisted from our sport. Like as if she was the worst person ever, that how disrespectful she was to those coaches into this sport by her choosing to speak out. So this is the thing now, like the, we, we get to the solution portion, right? Because this is untenable. It is happening everywhere. Uh, okay. you, you are but two voices in a sea of, of uh, people that have been put through the ringer in systems, not just by individual predators, but in systems that keep this rolling. And so uh, we've seen that studies show that the um, average age of disclosure is around uh, for childhood sexual abuse, about 52 years of age. So I get really frustrated when I see, you know, why is she coming through now? Why didn't she say anything then? Because it was a whole system to keep her quiet. And there were plenty of people making sure that happened. So um, I know that uh, in direct relation to the statistic, John, you're um, working to extend statute of limitations laws uh, why do you, th- and you mentioned a little bit about, you know, somebody not coming forward until the right time when maturity and all that's baked into them, but uh, why do you think survivors take so long? Well, in, in my case, um, it was everything you did at Michigan was a norm, but it was a, another level from high school, so you never questioned it. Uh, and then I also think that we, the brain is a powerful organ and there are times when we suppress, which we're trained to suppress all emotions to perform. So, and it, it like triggers um, that we talk about, you just don't know when the trigger is going to hit. Um, so I think a lot of that has to do with to the organizations that have been in, involved in cover-ups and, and, and all of these atrocities are global institutions. And you're constantly thinking about how that involvement not only will affect your life at the time, but the rest of your life. So you build this figment in your head that I couldn't have been who I am today without that organization. So there's almost a Stockholm syndrome type of phenomenon where you just can't, and and Trinae, you can, like, I couldn't believe that the man who came into my home, that the man who took me out of sports in Missouri would allow this to happen to me. Like, I just couldn't believe it. And so it takes time to come to grips with all that. Just like it takes time to come to grips with the end of your career. Right. And sometimes that college team or that gymnastics in the Olympics is the height at which you are defined as a person, right? And I think that that also, there's too much definition that athletes are just numbers and not people. And so you have to internally come to grips with, no, I'm more than just that athlete. And it's the totality of my experiences, whether good or bad, that define who I am as a part of said organization. And it's interesting because just about the age that athletes are quote unquote put out to pasture is just about the age that you're comfortable enough in your own skin to come forward and say, oh, by the way, what you put me through at just at the time you're ready to kind of throw me out and be done with me. Let me tell you what you did to me that never came out. Uh, and Trine, you know, the statute of limitations law is, is so essential. Wherever you are in the country, pass these laws so people can tell their truth and we can start breaking down these systems. Again, it's not about one predator. Trine, you work at Avalon Healing Center. And if you could just give us um, a, a brief moment, we're about to go into the question and answer period, but I'd love to hear just a little bit more of what you do there. 
So um, I am the Director of Development at Avalon Healing Center, and we are an organization that does comprehensive um, support for survivors of sexual violence. So we do anything and everything from the assault kit that um, happens initially to advocacy, to continuing education, to court um, advocacy, to um, you know support groups, peer support groups, all of those kind of things. And we really are, we're free and we're a space that I didn't know in a public space like I was in what to do or where to go to, or how do I find someone that supports survivors? How do I know who's trauma informed? Um, so I was told that there's a place right in our back corner, which there was, and realized that we have um, that kind of organization that's been doing this work for 16 years, well before my case or well before our cases. and realizing that if, if I didn't know about them, there are so many others that don't know about them. And how can I get with my situation? You know, I, I recognize my privilege in my situation. I recognize that, you know, most survivors never get justice. And here I am in a space, I'm a person that's white. I am a person of, of gymnastics. I come, it's a doctor. We have a settlement. My, my perpetrator did go to jail. I was able to give an impact statement. You know, these kind of things are not the common for survivors. So how can I best suit those survivors to give voice to the voiceless, to support survivors in our community, to get the word out that we exist and that survivors can have support because most suffer in silence because they don't even know what to do or where to go or who to talk to, or is there such a place? So, uh, you know, we're really lucky to have that here in Detroit, Michigan being number two in our country for sexual assaults, reported sexual assaults, number two. I mean, how, it's obvious, as we all know, of all these cases that are coming forward, why, why we're so terrible, but we also have those organizations such as Avalon that are there and that can, there can, this model can be taken to other communities, other cities to start supporting survivors. It's amazing. And, and it looks like the, the premier questions that we're getting in uh, um, all kind of crystallize around the same type of thing. Um, uh, how parents and caregivers um, can protect youth and how coaches can be proactive in both creating a safe environment for athletes and protecting um, themselves as well. So those are two, kind of two prong question. One, uh, what, can, what can be done from the parents' perspective? And then also if you're a coach, how can you, um, you know, be preventative? And I think when they mean protect themselves, um, you know, it, it's about making sure that they're giving the young people information, but also um, creating a secure environment. And I always say, if you're a coach giving people prevention education, you're half protected already because it shows you care about the issue. But what, what can we do for the youth as we close out uh, our Q and A? Uh, think about kids, uh, the, a young dreamer, John, he's looking at you and he's like, okay, I want to be that. Um, what, what, uh, what would you tell that young person in a, you could give them all the great football tips and that could last an hour, but what would you tell them about personal safety? Um, wow. Good question. I think this sums it up. Bo Schembechler, one of the greatest coaches that uh, ever coached college football around 1982, 1983, gave this statement in a video about recruiting. He says, if a football program is to be evaluated, the first thing you evaluate is what effect has it had on the youngsters that have played? Give the power back to the parents to ask all the tough questions of the coach, of the organization, look at the records of the doctors, the Title IX, the trainers, find out everyone that will be in contact and in charge of your son or daughter's career. Yeah. And most importantly, and I figure the more I say it, the more it will hit home, is I am not John Doe, I am John Vaughn. And I make sure that, that your kids will be your kids, not just the number. Take back control because these organizations wouldn't be who they were without us athletes performing. Well, I love you guys. And I think that, that um, we're unfortunately, I can't believe we're out of time, but that's the line. Give your child their name, 
their voice, their strength, and support these kids and believe them when they come forward. Uh, thank you both so much. John Vaughn, Trinity Gonser, you guys are amazing. We are on to the next panel already. And I just want to thank you so much for what you've shared here today, true heroes. So thank you. And we'll be back with enablers and institutional failures. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, both cases from the previous panel happened in Michigan. Uh, this can happen anywhere. Just last week, a USC was found negligent in a case involving a campus doctor and will pay $1.1 billion to survivors of his abuse. Other cases have come to light and it seems like there are new revelations daily. Clearly, if we are going to change things, we must look beyond the perpetrator towards institutional failures. Uh, we need to overhaul systems that allow these abuses to go unpunished for decades. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next two panelists. They will be helping us uh, unpack some of this systemic uh, information. So we began with uh, Chrissy Weathersby Ball, is a Hollywood stunt woman, yoga instructor, former competitive gymnast, wife and mother of two children. Uh, she was a division NCAA gymnast with full gymnastics scholarship to Michigan State University, where she earned all big 10 her sophomore year and graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology. She is one of the sister survivors and an advocate for victims uh, protection such as Title IX and an advisory board member of the National College Players Association. She has more than 70 credits in TV and blockbuster films and has won two Screen Actors Guild Awards for Best Stunt Ensemble. Next up, uh, Professor Amos Giora is a professor of law at the S&J Quincy College of Law at the University of Utah. His research contributed to legislation ratified by the Utah legislature and signed into law on March 23rd, 2021, criminalizing bystanders who do not intervene on behalf of children and vulnerable adults. Professor Giora has published extensively in the United States and Europe on issues related to the bystander effect, limits of interrogation, complicity, the limits of power, multiculturalism and human rights. Before releasing Armies of Enablers last year, he wrote The Crime of Complicity, The Bystander and the Holocaust. Thank you both for joining us and sharing your expertise regarding what can be done on social and institutional levels to stop sexual abuse. Chrissy, uh, like the survivors in the previous panel, you went public with your story to protect others. Uh, I wanna thank you first for that courage on behalf of those in attendance and all who benefit for this, from this kind of very personal advocacy work. And I'm sure um, there are lives listening that will be changed every time they hear authentic survivor voices speaking. Um, I'd like you to tell us about uh, the Title IX report you made during your time at Michigan State and what the process was and what the outcome was of you making that report. Uh, the report of me coming forward. Okay. Um, and the time that just that just kind of recapping what my experience was there. Is that what I you're asking? So. Yeah, just your personal experience, because I think everybody has um, abuses. So uh, personal and yet universal when people hear something uh, that reminds them of their story, but they don't know the process, what comes next, that can be almost as scary as keeping a secret. So kind of letting people know that coming forward process. Sure. Um, you know, I came forward a little bit later in the process because as John and Trené had so eloquently discussed about the grooming and the experience um, and my experience as a collegiate athlete, but also as an elite gymnast before I got to college, there's so many years of that conditioning and training of uh, brainwashing basically, of uh, thinking that being treated the way we were being treated is a form of love. And so um, to hear 
about Larry at the beginning, you know, as many gymnasts did at the beginning, it was like, no, that wasn't me. And there's no way this happened. And I know Larry, he's so nice. And he helped me because he was, as Trené said, the good cop and a lot of the bad cop uh, environment that I was also in in college. There were so many things wrong that were happening during that time to not only me, very similar to what John said, but to my teammates. And so that became just the norm. And so Larry was the one that was always there. And I was always injured. I was injured from the day that I stepped foot on campus <laughs> to the day I left Michigan State, but I was much more injured when I left with him as my doctor. And so um, Larry was very instrumental in my medical disqualification because I was only able to compete for two years. Uh, again, I came in as an elite athlete, a full ride scholarship gymnast, and I was only physically able to compete for two years because I was so injured. And so Larry facilitated my medical disqualification and was very instrumental or so I thought in my injury and recovery process while I was a collegiate athlete. And so to hear many, many, many years later that uh, he was not only abusive to these young girls at that time currently, but way back, it, it was unfathomable. You know, for me, I had firmly ended up believing the lie that I was the problem, that I just could not handle being a college athlete and that there was something severely wrong with me. And so to even think that the person or the many people that I had held in such a high esteem could have allowed this to happen, just it, it just it just wasn't even able to, to penetrate my reality at that point. And it wasn't until I heard all of the women over and over and over again, share their stories. It was like, it was just breaking down these walls with inside of me because what they were saying was exactly my experience. Right. But it was predator, so unimaginable. Predators are great at this, right? It's one of their, their um, ultimate techniques. See the vulnerability, whether uh, in, in one of our earlier panels where Jonathan described, you know, his mother had breast cancer. So of course there's a vulnerability to getting a cancer check from a doctor or feeling like I'm injured and people are pushing me. Well, that now here's um, a soft shoulder to kind of cry on who's saying, you know, no, don't worry about it. I care about you. I'll help you. And uh, that's what predators do. They find that soft spot or wound and they infect it. And uh, you know, now you're you're a board member of the National College Players Association, and you have an, a, the ability to use your experience to to create some kind of bigger change. Um, can you tell us more about their focus on college athletes' rights and why they felt there was this need to go all in for that? Sure. Well, um, the executive director of the National College uh, Players Association is actually an alum of UCLA, Ramogi Huma. And he started the National College Players Association because he had seen one of his teammates getting punished for taking food when he didn't have any food. And yet they were selling his jersey in the shop down the street, making all of this money. And yet he wasn't allowed to take food. And so that's how the National College Players Association originated. And currently uh, we are fighting for the rights for current college athletes to have the right to their name, image and likeness because they generate billions of dollars as well as health and safety protections for current athletes um, that just simply don't exist right now. So it's really shedding light on what's happening. This is, these are not things that just happened during my time or Jonathan's time, but it's happening right now in front of everybody's eyes. And so uh, that's what we are continuing to try to do is give a voice to what it was like to being a full ride scholarship athlete what our experience was like to literally be owned by the university mm -hmm. and to continue to give voices 
to those kids because they are kids that do not have a voice at this point. Well, and we have a history in our world of um, uh, the name, likeness, and who you are internali internally being depersonalized. You know, whether you talk about, you know, some of our earliest and darkest history, uh, all the way through um, some of what uh, Professor Giora writes about, where, you know, uh, depersonalizing, giving someone a number, whether it's uh, uh, historical numbers that are, are so deep and painful in our history or a number on the back of a jersey that suddenly kind of removes who you are and puts you in a collective and we're all going to be one and we're all going to act alike and then a system can begin to work to control and sometimes the system can be good and it can move you in a positive direction and sometimes it can be uh, menacing and completely evil and exploit and use and abuse. And uh, I want to get into a little bit of that con contextual piece of all of this with Professor Giora. Uh, we're taking the conversation a little bit beyond the predator into the predatory systems of apathy. And um, in your uh, recent book, uh, you discuss some of these issues at, in, in detail, um, you discuss that abusers don't act in a vacuum, that it's facilitated by enablers and bystanders and uh, who fail to act. And, and we think we know what those words mean, but I, I wonder if you could um, give us in context what you see a bystander and what is an enabler in enabling uh, this institutional complicity. Sure. Straight to the point, because time is limited. The predator doesn't operate in a vacuum, he or she benefits absolutely from the enabler and the bystander and definitions are important. The bystander is the individual who is physically present and sees another person in peril and has then the option, do I act or do I not act? As you correctly mentioned in the, the introduction, I've been very involved in legislating um, the criminalization of the bystander um, because I genuinely believe as did the Utah legislature that someone who sees a child and or vulnerable adult and makes the decision not to act that perhaps that needs to be criminalized, and that's indeed the case here in Utah. So the bystander is physically present. The enabler, and if listening to the stories of Jana, uh, Jonathan, and, and Chrissy, what they really were the victims of, leave Nasser out of it. It's the enabler. And the enablers are, are the one who were not present, but knew or should have known of the vulnerability of the person um, in peril, and make the, the conscious decision to engage in what I call institutional complicity or enabling institutional complicity. And so for me, with all due respect to the perpetrator, whether it's Anders, Dr. Anderson at Michigan or Nasser with um, the gymnasts, they're not, um, they're not the problem. The real problem are the enablers and the bystanders and the people we really need to go after. And that's why I so welcome the opportunity to speak um, with, this, with you all today. We need to make a conscious decision as, as a society that the enabling culture is something that we need to aggressively uh, address. We need to put an end to it because as long as we don't, then the perpetrator, whether it's at Michigan State, Michigan, USA Gymnastics, Ohio State, Penn State, I mean, we could go on at LSU. Um, those of you who are following sports carefully know that what's happening at LSU is, is just another one in the line. And the, the real issue is how do we go about addressing inst institutional complicity? And how do we hold institutional actors responsible and ultimately accountable? It's true, you mentioned that USC got the $1.1 billion, but we all know that $1.1 billion for USC it's like, it doesn't even, it's not even equivalent to a cup of coffee at Starbucks right. because insurance companies pay for it. The question is, are you going to hold institutional actors accountable? Absent that, I'm sorry to say there will not be any change. And the fact that, that you know, the three wonderful survivors are speaking is essential. But what the audience must know is that the, the predator, Nasser, Anderson, and so on, um, they're just simply enabled by the enablers and the, the the true for me, the true criminals, and I use that word very deliberately, are the institutional actors who enable the crimes. They're the ones who we have no choice but to go after and go after them hard. Well, and you have this problematic chain of the the the, the true um, original Cretan, the the direct actor who's harming these folks, then the bystanders you describe, that person who actually has some moral relativity but decides to stand by, and then as you describe, then um, the larger uh, apathetic culture. And boy, you put. So I'm, I want to disagree with you, Daphne. It's not apathetic. The institutional actors are not apathetic whatsoever. They're active. They're active. That Absolutely makes correct. Yep. They are active in, in protecting the institution because they have cast their die with the institution. 
There's a variety of reasons which we don't have time to get into, but why someone makes the decision to enable the institution rather than protect the person. They're not apathetic. They are act, they're active in their enabling. Enabling is problematic that the criminalizing the enabler and the bystander is difficult for lawyers because it's the crime of omission rather than the crime of commission. It's easy to punish the predator because you know he's the one who did something. Omission, which is ostensibly not doing, is, is harder for, for um, you know, people in my profession to grapple with, but I genuinely believe that the enabler are, are in many ways far guiltier, if you can you know, spectrum this, yeah. than, the, um, by, than the perpetrator. I've all, I speak often to, to prosecutors and I tell them, you know, it's, there is, the, the media wants to go after the perp, I get that, right? I mean, it's front page of the paper and all that. The far more difficult, um, challenge, if you will, what absolutely must be done is to shift. Yes, the perp is important, but as long as we don't um, go after the enabler and the bystander, what you heard from the three survivors, as we are having this conversation, someone somewhere, and listen to the, the great work Trian is doing, oh. somebody somewhere is being um, um, violated somewhere because the perpetrator knows two things. The perpetrator knows that because of the enabler, they have immunity and they can act with immu impunity and they know that as they're running towards the goal line, think about Vaughn as a football player, the perpetrator is running to the goal line, standing at the goal line is the vulnerable um, child of, or survivor victim because the, the um, perpetrator is, has around him, you know, offensive line, if you want a football metaphor, has an offensive line who are the enablers who are enabling him to run to the end zone untouched. We have no choice but to address that. So they're all partners in, in, in abuse. You've got the, the abuser, the enabler, the bystander, all allies, all working together to harm uh, a, a vulnerable victim who doesn't have that same group of allies on their side uh, reaching out to-, to, to I, think from the, I think from the enabler's perspective, I don't, this will sound disrespectful to the three survivors. The Luanna Simons at Michigan State, and by, by the way, Luanna Simon was an absolute enabler, so was Kathy Clegg as um, the gymnastic coach. I mean, these were terrible enablers. They didn't really think about the gymnasts. They thought about how do I protect Michigan State? The enablers at Michigan who knew about what Anderson was doing to, to Vaughn and the, the thousands of other players who played Michigan, they didn't really care about, no disrespect to Vaughn, they didn't care about John. What they cared about was one thing, protect the brand, because for them, that's the only thing that mattered. Yep, and the money behind it. And, you know, Chrissy, uh, in, in February, you and a fe fellow sister survivor asked Michigan State's Board of Trustees to hear concerns about, ding, the money, $10 million healing fund mentioned in the film that was established in 2017. It was supposed to provide financial support for medical expenses for the group. So, um, you know, when we talk about uh, these systems all colluding, um, uh, to protect one another, can you tell us what problems you've encountered in just accessing basic funds for treatment? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just, uh, it's actually appalling that, uh, <laughs> and, and they should be frankly completely embarrassed that we still have to talk about and basically beg them to pay for medical treatment that they volunteer to say that they would pay for in helping for a treatment. And so you, like I've submitted medical uh, documentation. This is the treatment that I'm getting. I will get a denial email almost instantly. Then to add insult to injury, in a few days, they'll make sure they mail a letter denying your claim too, just so that you know you've been denied. And so when you finally get to the point of accepting help, because as an elite athlete, as a collegiate athlete, it's very humbling to ask for help because we've been trained not to, that that's a form of weakness. When we do get help and medical attention to have that be denied is just another failure from the institution. And, and, and to just talk about those enablers for just a moment, the description of them having that offensive line is incredibly accurate because um, John Angler, who was the interim president for Michigan State University said when the NCAA did not give one penalty to Michigan State University for all of the abuse that happened with Larry Nassar, he was like, well, it's a good thing that we didn't get a, we didn't get any of our scholarships taken. 
So the focus was that the football team wasn't penalized, that the NCAA didn't hand one penalty to that university. So again, they literally can basically do whatever they want to collegiate athletes still and right. not get penalized. How many penalties has the NCAA given Ohio State University? How many have they given to the University of Michigan? None. So we're not gonna it's count not okay on- to be sexually court. assaulted by your doctors as a college athlete. That's what they're saying. It's okay. If, but, Jeff, if I can pick- you know, like a piece of money. Absolutely, please. If I, if I can piggyback off that, I just, um, cause you have, you know, John here and just to follow up on what Chrissy said, she's hundred percent right. So much so that um, Vaughn and I are writing a book together. Um, it's called tentatively entitled Piercing the Veil um, in which we're going to document not only what ha happened to John at Michigan, but ha what happened to the others at Michigan. But um, looking at Michigan, looking at the Big Ten and exactly as Christy correctly notes, also going after the NCAA. And the, the title, the Piercing the Veil is intended to do just that. It's um, maybe allegorical or metaphorical, but there's also frankly a piercing there because it's clear to us as we're, you know, we wear Woodward and Bernstein had here in writing the book that if we don't go after those three institutions, Michigan, Big Ten, NCA, hard, and I use every word here, um, not impulsively, but deliberately, um, we're committed to this effort because we genuinely believe that we're going to have to shine a very, very bright flashlight, maybe headlight is a better word, on these three institutions, because otherwise, here's what's going to happen. Um, I'm the oldest person here by about 100 years. Um, when, so sure. <laughs> oh, I'm confident of that. When you all are my age, you're going to have the same damn conference. And you're all going to say, oh, my, this happened again. It happened at Michigan State, Ohio State. And, you know, that's why I'm so honored to be here, you know, because John and I together. The time has come to act. And the, what we're trying to, what we want to do in this book is not only to tell what happened to Vaughn, but it's frankly an expose. How do we move forward by holding, again, I'm repeating, holding accountable those who ne need to be held accountable. And, you know, Christy mentioned Angler. I mean, you know, Christy, you know, offline, you and I could talk about John until, not Vaughn, but Angler, yeah. you know, until forever. Um, yeah. But that's not the point of today. But the point of today is to share with, with the audience that, for instance, Vaughn and I are teaming up to write this damn book and to absolutely, I don't know any other way to put it, but hold accountable those who need to be held accountable. Uh, because Let's otherwise do that right now, let's do that right now, because I want to pierce the veil on something. I've got a question for you. And I like the naming of names and I like the call out. Um, I think that's the thing that's going to pierce. It's, it's, it's yes. not just general talk, right? It's like, doesn't work for me. That one. Yes. Um, so Professor Giora, last Friday, uh, the Michigan Attorney General announced they were forced to close the MSU investigation because the Board of Trustees refused to release more than 6,000, not 100,000 documents related to the Nassar scandal, citing attorney-client privilege. So I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, what can be done to encourage institutions to be more transparent to pierce the veil. You know, it's a great question. So the, the decision about not releasing the documents, just like today or yesterday or today, a judge ruled that the two trainers at Michigan State, um, um, and I, you know, I think some of you know, I've spent hundreds of hours with, with Tiffany Thomas Lopez. Um, and with the, what Hayden and um, Destiny uh, Hawk did to Tiffany is outrageous. And for that not to be seen in that light, you want to be accountability, they need to be held accountable. Yes. In terms of, there's no doubt about that. Again, I speak as someone who's on the record, I speak this on the record, I've spent so many hours with Tiffany and what, the, what Hayden and, and Destiny did there is beyond outrageous. Um, with respect to the release of this, uh, the failure to release the 6,000 documents, you know, there you go, it's hiding behind the veil. And you want, that exactly is an example of, of needing to pierce the veil. Um, you know, the attorney general wanted it, the court ruled this way, the courts ruled that way, problematic. Um, I'm a firm believer, not, be, not only because I teach law, but I really do believe in the legal process and perhaps more than that, or part and parcel of that. I really believe in criminalizing. Um, I've been told that I'm too much stick, not enough carrot. Um, I really believe that if we don't go after the senior officials hard, ain't right. nothing going to change. And whether it's the board of, um, the regents or at LSU now, the board of supervisors. Um, this is really what worries me.
I know we're all distracted. There's, the, there's COVID and there's, there's this and this. But here's the reality. Listen to the three survivors. Sexual assaults are a worldwide epidemic. That's the reality. Yes, COVID is, temp COVID is bad, right. but it's, it's going to go away. Sexual assaults are a worldwide epidemic. And if we don't address that epidemic, then an epidemic really will become this, this just will mushroom. And that's the reality. The wonderful thing about a conference like yours today is you're giving not only voice to the survivors to which you're to be congratulated, but you're also enabling, sorry, but enabling the educated, educating the public about enablers and bystanders. That's the real challenge. Um, with all due respect to the perp, it's how we go after the enablers and bystanders and how we pierce that veil. Well, and to that effect, you know, and congratulations once, uh, once again on uh, getting legislative legislation criminalizing bystanders who failed to act passed in Utah. Um, how groundbreaking is that type of legislation in relation to other countries? And I also wonder about the enabler piece of that then is there legislation that criminalizes the enabling of- um, So there, there are 10 states that have uh, bystander legislation. There are 28 countries at last count that have this. What we did here in Utah is um, the, the person who does, who ignores, if you will, the plight of the child and or vulnerable adult, class B misdemeanor. And if you're a teacher or, and or employed in um, law enforcement or in social services, you may end up losing your job, um, which that's, you want accountability and responsibility. The question you asked is, is, a, is a great question about criminalizing the enabler. It's the next step. Will it happen tomorrow morning? No, because there is this complexity of the crime of omission. But as, as um, Vaughn knows, I am utterly and totally dedicated. Um, and I apologize for my English. I'm sorry the way this sounds, but I'm totally dedicated to kicking ass on this stuff. Um, because absent that, right. ain't nothing gonna change. And it, criminalizing enabler is the next step. Um, you know, um, this, is what I, this is what I do. And this is why I'm so grateful to be invited to speak with you all today. This is a team effort. People got to get on the damn uh, bandwagon because otherwise the perpetrators, the enablers and the bystanders will just ch chuckle, chuckle and won't change their ways. And to quote the esteemed professor, the ass kicking is so essential because what we've seen is enablers and bystanders and all of these folks, they don't police themselves. And it's time to create safer systems so that, that poor victims uh, in these circumstances and then nay all these year later survivors don't have to do the work for them. Um, Chrissy, what can people do to further impose responsibility and accountability? We've sort of gotten into it with some of the criminalization. What are some other things that are possible within these institutions to, to get a little more accountability? Sure, that's a great question. I, I think that you also have to hit them in the pocketbook. And when, when they have to pay, when donors stop donating, when alum, when alum say, we will not stand for this, I will not buy another jersey, I will not buy another ticket, I will not support this until I see that you are treating our student athletes like human beings. There has to be a stand of no tolerance, period. And right now there is so much tolerance happening, right? Like all of this stuff is happening at Michigan State and they've got, you know, pre-COVID, uh, everybody's still going to football games. Everybody's still, you know, they've, they've got some of the highest donations happening still currently with all of this happening. And so until, until they get hit in the pocketbook. And that's not just with alum, by the way. A lot of these institutions have, have funds from the state, you know, public funding. So if they're not gonna release documents, then why are they getting funding? They have to be hit in the pocketbook along with the criminalization. And, and that really seems to be the only way that things will change because as you said, uh, which, which John uh, expressed so well, they, they will not police themselves. If, if anything, everybody is in it for their own good. And I think that's one of the hardest things to take in as an athlete who has been trained to completely sell out for your program, that your coaches are there to get their pensions and to pay for their family. You've got the athletic departments, the presidents, they all have their pensions for life. And what do we have for life? We have injuries, disease, and abuse. So until we 
till we as a complete community say no more, then it will keep happening. Absolutely. And Dr. Uh, Professor Giora, you know, when you, when you talk about, um, you know, direct action, uh, and things that, that we, let, let's say you don't have a background in this, you don't even have, a, what about somebody watching right now who doesn't even have personal experience, but is touched by what the survivors are saying, what they're learning from you. What is an action item that you could ask somebody to do who's just, who's watching right now um, to say, you know, if you could do one thing, contact your center, do it. What would you like them to do? Three things. Um, one, um, contact your, your state representative. Because the, the way this is going to move up, enabler bison legislation is, is states up. Um, so, you know, contact your state legislator. To be as much as you can, um, social media is a, is a important, has impact in terms of holding, um, if not people accountable, at least shining a light on them. And as uh, Chrissy is right, I mean, I have friends who went to um, Michigan State, who have made the decision not to donate money anymore, which is can be effective. Um, and if you're, you know, a high end giver, if you go public with that, that clearly has an impact. But I do. It may be the third thing, maybe the most important thing. When a survivor comes to you and shares their story with you, believe them. Um, one of the, we, we all know this, that the instinct of so many people when they hear from a survivor that this such and such happened to me is not to believe them. I think that is absolutely essential to um, have a profound shift there. And that maybe the third or fourth thing is if I think about Kathy Clegas, who was so dismissive of, of Lindsay Lemke when Lemke came there and told her about what Nasser was doing, that those who are in position of power are going to have to absolutely have a profound shift. And if they do not, they need to be held accountable that's why I said, you know, Vaughn and I, I don't know if it's a flashlight, it's a headlight, it's a beam, whatever the hell it is. Um, you know, I, may, if I, if I will finish with this and I don't want to again be impolite, but I can only quote myself. The ABA did a profile on me and they said, well, so how are you doing with all this? And I said, I have the following to say on behalf of the survivors, I am truly pissed off. And that is what motivates me back to what I said earlier to kick ass. I apologize for my language because otherwise nothing's going to change. Well, and I understand the fury. I mean, one of the things we've been working so hard um, with, with um, Foundation for Global Sports, with Child Health, is just trying to get the most basic body education in youth sports. Um, it's my body, how to tell a safe adult, and to learn that if anything happens to you, it's not your fault. These are some pretty straightforward. There's one other thing I had to say. I gave a talk a year ago to 800, 800 eighth, no, seventh and ninth graders here in Salt Lake City. Right. Absolutely, to educate young people about the enabler and the bystander. I'm told that um, there's not, no reason not to start this in fifth grade, fourth grade. I don't have kids here in the States because we live in Israel. But um, to educate young people about the bystander and the enabler, there's no age, I think, early enough. I mean, I leave that to those who are educators who deal with kids, but absolutely to go to junior high schools, high schools, and to talk about the enabler and the bystander. The sooner we can do that, the better. I will tell you that we are starting in pre-K and going through 12th grade. Oh, there you go. Okay. And I got a call from a teacher who said, I don't think they'll understand this. And uh, then she called me a couple of weeks later and she said, a little boy was pulling at the address of one of the little girls. She stood up, she did a gesture, it's my body. He pulled his hand away and said, I'm sorry. And right there, I saw a cultural shift. I saw Excellent. A someone speaking up for themselves, but I also saw someone understanding this is bad behavior and my hands don't belong here. And if we raise a generation of kids in a different mindset, at least they're not um, the prey of the enablers and the bystanders and the predators because they've got something uh, at, the, at the core of their raising. But you know, it, it frustrates me that this has to be a fight, that it is misunderstood as sex ed when we are truly trying to teach our kids not to be sexually abused. So yeah, I get into that um, pissed off and, and ass kicking mode when it is- <laughs> I apologize no. for my language. No, oh, well, uh, we're, we're amplifying it because the doors are shut on that kind of a learning. And so Chrissy, you know, when you get to the point where you are that elite athlete, how could you have learned to be so adept at your athletics and yet be left so vulnerable 
in your self-care and, and, and your protection and your knowledge of what's right or wrong in terms of the way people interact with you. So you can be trained to use the finest muscle tune and everything that you do to become, it takes brilliance to become an elite athlete. And yet uh, you're left completely vulnerable when it comes to your, your spirit, your soul. You are because um, as John had mentioned earlier, there is some sort of a disconnect that you almost have to do with your body to get to that point. There is physical pain and discipline that you have to uh, do to achieve that level of um, uh, being an athlete. And so that disconnect, as well as the environment that you're in, as Trinae had said, it's like your family, you're around yelling and you're around this type of treatment all of the time. So we're just used to it. For me, it was just normal. Um, and, and so that's where those boundaries continue to fade away to the point where you don't have a voice, because if you shut off those tears, if you shut off emotions, then if somebody violates a boundary, then you question yourself. That was my experience. And that was so many of my teammates is that it's that gaslighting. It's like, I'm questioning myself because there's no way I should be feeling this way. What did I do wrong? And to add on to what you guys were saying uh, just a moment ago, I, I do think a focus absolutely still needs to be on the NCAA because you've got young teenagers. I was also 18, just like John. There were so many things that I was never exposed to until I went to college and they own me. They own the athletes. I actually called another college coach that had offered me a full ride scholarship halfway through my freshman year because I was being told to train when I was injured. And I just had never been treated that way before. And I was crying to him and I said, can I please come to your school? And he said, Chrissy, it's breaking NCAA rules for me to even be talking to you right now. Now at the time I didn't have the words to tell him. I just said I wasn't happy but there was something wrong and I was trying to help myself. And yet the NCAA owned me and they still own these athletes where they can say, you either will get an education or you won't get an education. And frankly, I didn't have a choice. I'm coming from a home where my parents in no way could afford the type of education that I was earning for myself as a full ride scholarship athlete. And so many athletes come from environments in that way where you are so vulnerable, the, that was my way out as so many athletes. So when you have a system that says, basically it's okay for us to abuse you. I don't know any other students who are allowed to be physically punished when they don't perform. You as athletes, we got physically punished to the point of vomiting when we would break rules or didn't perform accordingly. And so, You've got this dynamic that is not done in secret. Everybody sees it happening. If you Google right now, how many football players have either died from over conditioning or been sent to the hospital, you'd be amazed. But yet there are no penalties. There are no standards for the doctors that are there to protect these athletes. So I don't mean to go on, but this system is created to support this abuse that's happening currently right now to our athletes. One thing that I think is very interesting that as you've been speaking about this piece, we get a question that came in from the system essentially. So here, here is a kind of a, our Q and A portion. We have a, a question from a coach who witnessed grooming and gaslighting and asked what can coaches do to support athletes when they see it? In, out there somewhere like what can they do if assistant coach sees a coach acting you know what's what's the next step it's a i'll start and then chris you want to follow up um first of all there are whistleblower laws in play um and assistant coach may be hesitant to call out the head coach he's afraid of you know retribution of, of, afraid of losing his job that's exactly why we have whistleblower laws and i think that that um is something that needs to also be incorporated into the sports world. I think the assistant coach needs to understand that the duty he owes is to the person in peril and not to go team go. It's, but that maybe ties into, you know, I told you the three things to do. There's in addition to the stick, which I made clear that I believe in, 
There's also a significant educational undertaking that absolutely must occur here across the board. We talked about schools, but I think absolutely um, in the academy, obviously, but I think coaches, trainers, those involved in the sports world, um, there has to be a shift in or a shifting uh, in understanding to whom the duty is owed. I, I see that what I saw what Triana wrote here about the money. I mean, that's the issue. And Chrissy also mentions this. That's it. And it's not going to go away. It's just, you know, can't go poof, you know, magic dragon. Um, that's a major issue. And I will just stop with this. And I agree with what Chrissy says. And that's one of the things Vaughn and I are writing about is indeed the NCA. There's no argument on that. Well, and, and I, I, it's painful that we're out of time because I feel like we could sit here and hold a forum like this for hours and, and get so much accomplished. And we definitely have to all come back together and do this again, because uh, I think what well, you've got it, it's, it's to educate uh, from what Chrissy's talking about from the child to the coach, to the system, families, to the community, so that it, it's a very uncomfortable landscape for these predators to enact any kind of abuse. And uh, I have to thank all of you, uh, your passion, uh, and, and I will say your, your ass-kicking passion, uh, Professor and, and Chrissy, and I want to thank a Center for Media, Entertainment and Sports, our heroes at Global Sports Development, uh, all of the amazing people that step forward to tell some very personal stories. Uh, I believe when we make uh, institutions uncomfortable, impenetrable, and inaccessible to predators, uh, I think we make dreams possible for young athletes. And I want to thank you guys so much for being part of the solution. Thank you. Everybody a great day. Thank you.